Hey everybody, this is Melissa Dawn at the Ghostly Archives podcast. The live stream is going to start in a few moments, so I want to thank you guys for joining in and participating in this podcast. But before we start, I just want to ask you a big favor. If you guys could help the podcast grow, that would be fantastic. And it only takes a few clicks. You can do that by subscribing liking, sharing the content, and also on the audio podcast platform, if you could, and if you listen to us over there, give the podcast four stars because it really helps us out a lot. Okay, so hang on just another minute or so, and I'll be right with you here on the live stream with our wonderful guest tonight. All right, well, here we are live again at the Ghostly Archives. I've got a little Christmas wallpaper in the background, guys. Christmas is coming soon. And we were supposed to have Emily Men's House and do conspiracy theory today. That got shuffled around. Things changed up a bit, but I have a fantastic guest who offered to come in at last minute. I was going to bring him on in the new year, but I thought, well, let's do this just before Christmas because my guest hails from the United Kingdom. He is an author, an investigator, and now a documentary filmmaker. His name is Kieran Woodhouse. Um, He's here. We're going to discuss his latest documentary mixed with his latest theory. His documentary is called A Haunting in Essex. So we're going to have a little bit of discussion about that and what is the paranormal? What's going on? What are ghosts? But before I bring Kieran in, remember, you can support the show Subscribe, like, follow, rate, share, all those things. Um, it helps us grow. It helps me grow. I don't know why I'm saying us. I'm the host. But also, it helps us, as in me and my guests, to grow. If you go over to my guests' either websites or research their content out on Amazon and support them as well. So remember, subscribe, like, follow, rate the podcast five stars, and share the content. That's That's how you can support me and my guests and not even spend a dime. It's just clicking. It's super easy. And I appreciate you guys here. Normally, I'm a little later in the day. But let's let's bring Kieran in and we're going to talk about that. A haunting in Essex and some paranormal theories, some philosophy for the soul and the mind just before Christmas time. Oh, here we go. Welcome to the show, Kieran. How are you doing? Very good. Yeah. Good, good, good. What's happening in uh, in jolly England today? <laughs> um, okay, I mean the, the weather's kind of got a bit better now, which is which is good. Uh, we had about three weeks of nonstop rain. Um, wow. Which is uh, depressing with the dark nights and everything, but yeah, it's okay. Looking forward to to Christmas. Oh yeah, absolutely. I know. So I live in Utah now, and I used to live on Vancouver Island. And we would get rain and gray weather. Yep. And it would by the time February came, it was so depressing. But we actually get sunshine here in Utah. <laughs> so it's not hasn't been as bad. I haven't had that seasonal effective stuff that uh, you usually get when you live in cloudy, rainy, wintry climates like that. So well, I'm glad it's gotten better. Now you do you I just one question before we go in. Do you live in Essex? Is that the area that you're living in now? No, no. So I, no? I live in, um, well, I've recently moved. So uh, I'm originally from uh, an area called the Black Country, which is in mm-hmm. the West Midlands near Birmingham. Um, and now we've moved out towards a place called Shrewsbury, which is a different county you know, called Shropshire. Wow. We're, near, we're not far from Wales now, where we are. Um, but the... Essex is quite far. It takes me about three hours to get down to Essex. And I know for your American audience, three hours is just a trip to the local shop for, for a lot. Well, you, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be honest. I wouldn't want to make a three-hour drive. Personally, I think that's a lot of driving. But when you compare it to, say, driving across Texas takes like a couple of days. No, we're like, yeah, no. whatever. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> I, I have, I, have um, I used to have American friends that would come over and they would, they would like, 
laugh because I would moan about driving an hour up the road and to them it was just normal. Well, if we want to go visit my in-laws, we just drive an hour and we're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> They're in another town. We're like, yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. And yeah, it's it's so vast. It's so big here. It's it's totally, we have a totally different context. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. very different. So then the next question is, why Essex? What drew you to focus on a haunting in Essex in that area of, of England? Um, so it's it's a house specifically in Essex. Um, mm-hmm. So I um, I gave a talk at a, a group called Sufon, which is Swansea UFO Network in Wales. And I, um, as I always do when I do these talks, meet meet a, you know a lot of lovely people. And I was put in uh, touch with a lady called Daniela and her husband Bruce. And Bruce is actually one uh, frequent talking head on Ancient Aliens, the, the, the TV program. So Bruce and I have become quite close friends, uh, as have myself and Danny, his wife. And Danny is a medium, and she put me in touch with this family who were having uh, quite a lot of trouble, mm-hmm. and um, said, I, I think you should go down and, and have a look. So I contacted the family, and they were very welcoming. They, they, they let me go down, went down several times, um, collected a lot of evidence, which which is available in the documentary, um, and 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 yeah, we ended up making making a film about it um, because such was the the activity that was happening and the impact on on the family as well. Wow, interesting. And you know, in Utah, apparently, and I know I've been to different locations that are very strange. There's a lot of eccentricities as my husband would put it in utah you've got a lot of different weird areas so i'm supposing it's the same in essex i think um it's not a place i would associate with that kind of thing it it, the the house itself is seven miles from the enfield haunting location okay everybody knows um yes it has that about it um for me there are more what you would associate more haunted places in, in, in the UK. So we have York, for example, which is which is famous for its ghostly goings on. We have that famous story in York about the, the Roman legion that was seen walking through the basement. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. I have. I have. That's a very famous. And they were walking like they weren't level. That's it. They, they were missing the current day. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, that, I know that, what that, you're talking about. Yeah, so that's so that's in York. You can regularly take ghost hunts around York. Uh, Whitby, which is not far from York, so Whitby is where Bram Stoker wrote Unbased Dracula. Yeah. So again, a lot of ghostly tales and folklore that go on around there. Essex in the UK is associated with. Um, so we had a program called The Only Way Is Essex on TV, and it's associated with these kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, uh, young men and women who are very rich, who don't need to work, who drink lots of champagne and they're not very clever um, posh posh, yeah, brainless. It was, it was, posh and it brainless <laughs> it was a kind of reality tv show you know uh, oh yeah was, yeah yeah it, it was put across like it was real it was put across like it was it was it was so, real life but it wasn't here's the thing but is isn't borley rectory in essex uh, i believe so yeah it's a, that's pretty famous for it is famous. Being yeah. the most yeah. haunted house in england <laughs> again i i would I, I would argue that there were probably more known haunted locations than anyone. Well, I mean, Harry Price, who was went to Borley Richter, he was like one of the original ghost hunters. Yeah. It's like that you would probably, even before Hans Holzer and the Warrens in America, you would probably point back to Harry Price on yeah. him. He had a really wealthy wife. Mm-hmm. And he, so he was, he had been in more of a scientific field, but he was able to, he was taking that into the paranormal and sort of trying to be scientific about it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was good. And the fact he had a wealthy wife is what allowed him to, to kind of play mm-hmm. around really. You know, he didn't, he didn't yeah. have to worry about earning money. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is a famous place, uh, Borley Rectory, of course, but I, I think Essex in itself, it's not, I wouldn't. If I was putting on a ghost hunt or if I was looking for places to go, Essex wouldn't be the place that springs to my mind. Interesting. But, yeah, you've got this location that you've done a documentary yes. on. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the house – and and what's really interesting is we we have uh, we were in the house at one point when the house was shaking and vibrating. 
and it's um, what we would call a semi-detached in England. So it it shared a wall with the house next door, and um, they had nothing, no shaking, no vibration, nothing. So it was very, um, very focused on the house. Again, when you think about the area, it really was just the house. So something happened with whomever is living or have lived in that location. There's um there's a whole backstory which obviously is, is is within the documentary. I also talk about some of this in in my second book as well. But mm -hmm. essentially, the 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 one of the daughters of the family um had not long lost a friend, and the friend uh, I'm not quite sure how they died, um, but they were they were young, they were teenagers essentially, and um they were her this girl and her friends were out. They were in a churchyard. They were drinking alcohol. Um, and one of them fell into an, uh, an open grave and um, so they managed to get her out of the grave they, tried, they got home to, 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 to this house and then they decided to do a seance to try and contact their, their deceased friend and while they were doing it the, the, the electrics and the fuse box completely blew up um, which prompted screaming so at that point, the dad has gone downstairs and said, "What you know? What the hell's going on here?" And you know, pack it in and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and that was it. And then about two weeks later, um, Lee, the, the 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 dad, was on the phone to Kelly, the mum. She was working. He was in the house on his own, and they heard uh, three distinct loud bangs on the front door. Uh, he describes it as it's how the police would knock on your door. So he goes to answer the door. No one there. Within about five minutes or so, he begins to hear footsteps upstairs goes upstairs, nothing there. He then captures probably one of the best pieces of footage I've ever seen. And it's, a, it's right at the start of the documentary. Um, yeah, we well, don't want to give it away. We wanna, you yeah, know, so uh, if you guys want to see more, um, it, just before I say anything, is, is the documentary done and out or is it still yeah, to be yeah, released? Yeah, it's, it's on YouTube, so I can get, I'll, I will send you the link. I mean, is there a possible way that I can send it you now? And you can um, yeah, yeah, you can, there's a private chat button in the software we're using to stream or you can send it on facebook and i'll i'll pop it in the the chat people can check it out but that's yeah wow that is that's it, fascinating it, it, yeah i mean we had um pennies were thrown they they must have collected dozens and dozens of pounds worth of pennies that were just thrown and they would materialize so the one thing i um i kind of encouraged them to do was to collect the pennies and put them in a jar because then they would know if the pennies were being stolen out of the jar or thrown. And every time new pennies were thrown, they would count the jar and the jar would would always be growing. So these pennies were materialising from somewhere. They weren't being recycled. Um, but I mean, the first time we went down there, I was in the house for a minute, two minutes, and I had a penny thrown off my head. Um, and we again we captured that on the documentary because what we ended up doing was putting up motion sensor cameras around the house. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happening in different rooms when they weren't there. So a lot of the footage that we managed to capture was was through these motion sensor cameras. Right. So so when you come to these investigations, you're being fairly, I, I mean, scientific in a way. Like you're you're you want material evidence. You're being like you're, you, you, I mean, or is it a combination of both, like a, a medium and a more scientific yeah. approach? I, I, I mean, we've we've spoke about this before, but the the, the more I've done this, I, um, the, the smaller my kit bag has got. So I, I I tend to not use that much equipment now. I I think it can be falsified. It, you can't really rely on it. Um, it's expensive for what it is. I think people are cashing in on a lot of this equipment without it actually being proven to. To do what you want it to do, right? So, I've no. For me, I have a spirit board. I have an EVP recorder, um, and a, a UV light, which which I find quite quite useful. And myself, and, and I'm probably the best piece of equipment that, that I, you know, I can trust myself more than any. I agree. I totally agree with you. I actually just go with myself. <laughs> like yeah, I've yeah. I've been to my me and my husband went to the Benson Grist Mill near here. We were also near a ranch. That's a, a most of these locations I've gone to have appeared on Ghost Hunters, and they're all around here. And yeah. then I went to this Ted Bundy sort of demon house, which I doubt he was even there, but um, 
Yeah, uh, we just go and we check it out and we get a feel for it. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we were there, there's there was a lot of people around, so it's a little. I find it a little distracting. It would be nice to get in there without yeah. that. But yeah. yeah, it's. I I'm always just like, okay, well, I'll see how I feel when I go in there because I know a lot of time things on TV are exaggerated or dramatized. Like Ghost Hunters, honest to honest to goodness. When I watch their show, I mean, I've seen teenage girls at a slumber party with a Ouija board be less dramatic than some of the stuff they do. <laughs> you know, I think it's entertaining though, and it's sort of like, okay, well, let's go to some of these locations. So I find it fascinating that you've come to that conclusion. Yeah, it, it's I. I mean, I. I, I there's, a, there's a funny story that I tell. Um, so during lock during the lockdowns, when we were when our captors allowed us out. Free, uh, for, for a little bit we would um we would we went to this to this ghost hunt and i like to support local groups so i went to this one in wolverhampton which wasn't far from where i lived at the time uh, and it was to a place called gresley old hall and it's known as the house that cries and that, that it was dubbed that by the bbc because they would frequently find a puddle of water in the hallway at the bottom of the stairs and they had mm-hmm. no idea where the water would come from they would mop it up and it would reappear and, and there was no leaks, there were no taps in the area, they didn't know how it was happening, so it's known as the house that cries. Um, so I went along on my own, uh, paid to go with this group, never been with them before. Um, they've got, and I walk in and they've got all this equipment, and I mean it was like, you know, you know James Bond when he walks into that room and they've got all the stuff that they're testing out? It was kind yeah. of like that. And, and they've got um, machines and devices, full desktop PCs hooked up, um, and, we, and they were using all these apps on the, on their phones, which you know, I mean, how easily can they be falsified? You know, um, and and all I can hear are these apps talking and shouting and beeping. So eventually, we split off into groups, and I, I sit in the corner of this room, and I'm, I've been there before, and I kind of know the, the vibe. I'm kind of got my hood up, and I'm like yourself, I'm just zoning out, trying to see what I can feel. Mm-hmm. And um, all of a sudden, the door bursts open, and this man like walks in with his torch on his phone in my face talking really loud to his live stream facebook group mm-hmm. um <laughs> and, you know oh so now we're now we're in the living room of the house and this is where this happens and we've seen this and i'm just kind of like whoa calm down like i was in the zone then and then and then, and then off he goes into the next room and i and it was all for his followers on Facebook. And I'm just thinking, what is this? ADHD, like, crazy ghost hunter. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, so you've got 20 people here who've paid, I don't know, 30, 40 quid. Um, but, you know, sod them. You're just going to ruin the atmosphere for them because you want your 10 people on Facebook that are streaming to get to get something from this. Like, if so, I, so, I was, sorry, it, it just, it left, no, me really, Keep going. it left me really angry. So then we moved into the next room and, um, they were using these phones, and they would, uh, if you like a ghost radar, so that it would sh- it shout random words at you. So it will say like "girl," and then so these these ladies that were using these phones, I'm like, well, firstly, you're sat in the dark, staring at a bright like phone screen. That that's not going to mm-hmm. be good. Um, and secondly, you're taking everything that this app is telling you as gospel. So within ten minutes of being in this room, it had said random words like "girl," "fire." They said, well, where are you? And it said there. So they were like, oh, it's over there. So within 10 minutes, using this phone app, they had formed an entire story that there was a girl who was stuck there because she burned to death in a fire and couldn't find her family. And so she was haunting this place. And then, of course, a quick Google search on one of our breaks found that there'd never been a fire registered there. So that was all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, how much trust and faith they're putting into these apps? And then well, they're those, this whole story in their head. Like I've said this before to other people and on other shows, if they understood how the code was written, <laughs> they would know it's literally like a random, they put a bunch of, uh, almost like a library of words and it's randomly, yeah. they're just randomly picking from the what they've already yeah. amassed, where, yeah. however they've done it. And that's that's how the code works and people don't yeah. understand that. And it's 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 almost weird because we're not even going in and trusting our own intuition we we, we we want ai to tell us that too yeah and and, and you know it's just kind of you're that hooked to your phone to your device that you can't even sit in a dark room for half an hour and, mm-hmm. and, and, and take in the atmosphere and, and zone into it 
you're relying on a device to tell you about this now, you know? And we went to another room and they, they were using it again and it said, uh, girl, and they went, oh, she's followed us. And I was like, no, the, the, the app's just repeating itself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's my experience of modern technology, you know, when it comes to, to, to ghost hunting. So absolutely, the best thing I can do is minimise my, my kit bag and yeah. um, trust myself, really. Well, there is like... Um... There's a TV show out called The Holzer Files, and it was about Hans Holzer's, exp like his um, paranormal investigations. And they kind of, his daughter's on the show, and they pull it up and they kind of reinvestigate what he's done. And so, they use a medium, and Hans Holzer uses a medium. They didn't have all these ghost boxes. Yeah. And I find them really distracting, especially the ones that are really noisy. Mm -hmm. I have to shut the program off because it just it agitates me. Yeah. And yeah, like when I go, if I do record a place, it's not live streaming. I go and I check it out and I look around and I might pull my other phone out and do some footage of it to edit later so I can do a commentary on it. But I don't like to live stream when I'm at places at all. Yep. Um, I don't know. I, I don't I wouldn't want anyone showing up or saying, oh, they're over there. I don't want people to actually know I'm there. I just want to go and get a feel for it and maybe record some information. Yep. So. But w when you were dealing with this house in Essex and investigating, you told me that you started to come up with some other theories. I know we've talked about theory in the past. You've been on my other shows and you've talked about theories that David Icke was talking yeah. about with vibrations and frequencies and stuff like that. But you've come, you, you've sort of fleshed out some more theories about what the paranormal could possibly be. Maybe we could sort of get into that. Yeah, um, so it is. It's not. It's not a complete departure from those old kind of ways of thinking. It's more. It's more of a continuation. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, one thing that I, I have to say here that a theory is just a theory, and it, it's not the truth. So anybody listening to this that thinks this is a load of rubbish, that's absolutely fine. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why this theory cannot exist next to other theories. They might all be true, uh, or not. So. Really, when the more I spent in this the house and with talking to this family and kind of getting to know their their lives, they they're a very chaotic family. Um, by their own admission, they would regularly argue, fight, uh, shout at each other. The house was 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 regularly disorganised. Their uh, they had two autistic children, um, or still do. At the time, they were about eight or nine year old uh, twins, a boy and a girl. They had two teenage girls going through adolescence. So you can imagine there's a lot going on in this house. Uh, incredibly chaotic, both um, physically and, and mentally and emotionally. And it seemed that whenever this happened, um, the activity would increase and heighten. And one of the first things I ever said to them was, you, if you're going to fight or argue, take it outside. Don't kind of lower this vibration. Always keep high high vibration. Always try and keep it light. If you're going to fight, leave the house. And they practiced this for a bit. And whenever they did this, the activity would stop. And, and I mean completely stop. And then if there was fighting or arguing, the activity would begin again. And then, again, it's similar, to, I guess, to the Enfield Haunting, where they had these kind of adolescent children and how many hauntings are, um, I guess, associated with houses where you have these children who are growing up, they're teenagers, they're going through puberty, they're adolescent. Um, there's quite a lot of hauntings that are, that are in with this. Now, you imagine the emotions that are going on um, during this period of, of someone's life. Um, it's very, it can be very negative, but either way, it's very strong. And I found that whenever this was at its height, so was the activity. Um, and then not long after we'd finished the documentary, um, the, the one of the daughters had a baby. And while the baby, while she was pregnant and they were looking forward to the baby being born, uh, we did a bit of a follow-up with Lee. And he said, look, look we've, we've never been happier. The house is brilliant. Um, we've had no activity. We, we, you know, we're expecting a granddaughter. Everything's fantastic. Um, and then a child was born and everything was, was fine. And then the, um, 
the couple, the, the parents of that child split up. I don't think it was very good. I think it was quite a bit of a messy split up. The um, one of the other daughters' real dad died. They had they've had about five deaths in terms of their family and friends in the last like eight months. They haven't had a very good year. And when all this was going on, guess what happened? The activity started again. Yeah. And she messaged me. Well, she sent me a video of her stood outside a house, and every single light in the house was flashing on and off. Um, and there was no one in the house. And she was like, "I've had to leave the house. I, I, I don't know what's going on." So again, when when their when their personal lives hit a hit a hit a kind of rocky patch, and they were um, outwardly expressing that, then the activity would start again. And the more I noticed this, the more I began to consider, is it possible that they're creating this haunting themselves? Yeah, I, I wanted to posit another, a, a, an idea as well. Is it possible that there's something there and in order for it to exist, it has to be charged by that? Yeah, and, and, and I, I agree with that. And But I actually think that they can be the same thing. Okay. What, what you're saying and what I'm saying is essentially the same thing. So as we've spoken about before, you know, everything in this world is, is, is energy. It's a vibrational energy. So essentially, if this thing is there, they, their, their lives and their reactions and their emotions are therefore creating it. If, if they weren't like that, it wouldn't exist. Right. So, so you, you're, you're right. It, it, there is a slight difference. Either there is nothing there, but they're making it happen. But there's something, lo- or there's something dormant lying there, and they wake it up by feeding it with the negative energy. But either way, yeah. it's kind of the same thing. That it's well, it's still happen. symbiotic. Like they still yeah. nurture yeah. each other, and, and unfortunately, it's nurturing something that's not really healthy. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the thing is, it's one of these things where. I, I can't really imagine it happening the other way. You know, when a house is full of love and, and, and the vibrations are very high and everybody's getting on and it's great. But how would that express itself as a paranormal entity? Like, I don't, I can't imagine it would. Um, right. So I'm, I, don't, I don't know, like little fairies flying around the houses. I don't know. Hmm. Whereas when it's negative, it, it creates this kind of negative entity. Um, and, you know, the more cases I've looked at and particularly the more that this case kind of developed the more I began to think you know what I think they're creating this themselves and then what I did was I kind of took those old theories where we've spoken about you know um, that we create our own universe and the holographic universe and all that mm-hmm. and I kind of just developed on it and built on it and it, it and again it, it's still a work in progress as a theory always is um but the more I've thought about it and put it into practice, the more it, it's made perfect sense to me. Um, sorry. Have you heard of the skull experiment and the Philip experiment? Skull experiment, is that the one where they, they placed the camera film? In the... I believe it, the school experiment was done in 93, and it was a group of people in England. They were trying yeah. to, yeah. they were mediums, and they were doing some seances, That's trying true, yeah. to create, like, beings or something or prove that the afterlife existed yeah they locked themselves essentially in the basement and they had Mm -hmm. they put a camera a roll of camera film in a box that was locked and then they asked these things to to appear on the camera film and then when they exposed the camera film there were faces and figures on the camera film that had no way of getting there that which is like they're saying there's something really there but it could tie into what you're saying so so that they put it there they want it to happen, and therefore it has happened, and they've created it themselves. So if you follow the, the, the theory that we create our own universe, which I massively buy into, then it makes sense that everything that is happening in our universe is created by our own minds, and therefore we are creating paranormal activity. I mean, I've, I've said to you before, you know, these kind of people who, like the Virgin Mary, I always use this example, but she only ever appears to people that believe in the Virgin Mary. She she never appears to anyone else, and it's almost because they're so desperate to see her. Now, I'm not saying that she doesn't appear. She, she might very well. well appear, but only to people that want to see her. And and the, the Virgin Mary is, is supposed to be an archetype that you can identify with. So it's interesting that it's such a, 
a prominent figure and it's an important archetype too, but some people get so invested in it that yeah. they actually see it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder what kind of state of mind you have to be in to make that happen. I, 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 I get, but you talk about state of mind. So now let's apply that to someone that is going through a lot of grief or going through adolescence mm -hmm. or puberty. Imagine mm -hmm. their state of mind. Um, I once had a guy who, um, he called me up because he, he was worried about his friend and his friend was having a lot of activity and they sent me some videos and it was it was great you know we there were there were glasses literally sliding off kitchen worktops and smashing on the floor um a lot of activity and the first thing i asked this guy was what's happened in his life like recently and he's um his wife had killed had killed herself and so he was he and this was like three weeks four weeks after and I said, well, did this activity happen before? And he said, not really, no. So the two things that came to my mind were, well, either it's his wife who's now haunting the house, mm -hmm. or he's going through so much grief and this outpouring of this emotion. And again, that what you put out is what you get back. Um, and, and therefore he was creating this haunting himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was just another case where I thought, again, that, that ties into to, to what I'm thinking. Um, so, so if we were to take my old way of thinking with the holographic world and all of that, we have what we what I would call the, the collective conscious. And this is essentially everything that there ever is, will be, um, and, and has been. And we are all tapped into that collective consciousness. Um, and when, when we die, um, what you might call a soul or a spirit or whatever, um, rejoins the collective consciousness. It is essentially universal energy. And um, once you die and you rejoin it, you become oneness again. You become this collective consciousness. So I, for me, a, a development of this theory is that when you're interacting with the paranormal, and again, I don't just mean ghosts, I mean cryptids, I mean aliens, anything like that. It could be what's happening is you're tuning into this particular piece of energy you know, this dormant energy that, that maybe that you mentioned that was residing in this house, you're tapping into it and, and you're manifesting your wants, needs and beliefs onto this point of energy. And what you get back is subconsciously what you want. So if we think about, uh, so I had someone say to me, well, if this, if ghosts are just, you know, part of my mind, then how can my husband and I see my mum at the bottom of the bed talking to us? And I say, well, because this collective consciousness was your mum. It's also my mum and it's your mum and it's everybody's mum because it's collective consciousness. And all that's happening is you're tuning into it and getting back what you want. So when it talks to you and you think, well, it must be my mum because it t talks to me and it tells me things that only my mum would know and it looks exactly like my mum. Well, of course, because this collective consciousness would know what your mum would say it would know what your mum looks like because it was once your mum. Um, so for me, when people are having these paranormal experiences, they're just tuning into this collective consciousness essentially. And if you go back through time, this has been spoken about regularly. Um, so back in, in, in late 1800s, um, it was that they, they would talk about, uh, they would call it memory clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and essentially, it was a it was an archaic way of saying like we have the cloud now where we store all of our information in the cloud. Um, right. And so what they were saying was our thoughts and our words and our actions all go and are stored in this cloud. This was a theory around the late eighteen hundreds. I can find it for you. Um, and and it, it's stored in this cloud. And then what happens is when we see a ghost or a paranormal entity, we are just kind of picking bits out of this cloud, therefore, and seeing something that's happened in the past. And essentially, they were talking about this like 150, 200 years ago, and what I'm talking about now is is the same thing, really, this kind of collective well, consciousness or memory cloud. And what, well, what's interesting is we store things on a cloud now, digitally. Yeah. We store yeah. lots of information. So it's data and information, but this is sort of some more of an organic cloud, I guess you could say. That's pretty much right, yeah. 
Well, so what I find interesting is that all these phenomena are linked to negative, emo- a lot of negative emotions are linked to this. Do you mm-hmm. think there's some kind of survival aspect? Like there's some um, reason beyond just, oh, we do it because we project? Like, is there some sort of, you know, need to survive, need to get through grief or need to you know, um, get rid of that negative and put it somewhere else that it actually helps us thrive and get through things. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like um, an emotional soundboard, isn't it? You know, like when you mm-hmm. you, you would physically throw a dart at a board if you were angry, you know. You, so it's almost like you're doing that emotionally um, and, and mentally. You're kind of trying to get rid of it. And what happens is this entity or this energy, this this field force, absorbs that emotion and then kind of throws it back at you and and, mm-hmm. and so you're, you're getting back like as with the law of attraction what you put out is what you get back and therefore this force field is, is throwing it back at you and then you're getting that negative energy again yeah that's that's interesting because especially when it comes to like the reports of people who see their loved ones at the end of the bed after they have passed on mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like to believe I've had that experience and it was super, super real. Yeah. And I, I mean, at the time I wasn't even in serious grief. I was sort of like, oh, I was, you know, okay. But I like to believe that they were there and they were saying, I'm okay. It's okay. You can go on. But maybe that belief is the whole idea that's helping me get through the grief and survive the loss. So sub- subconsciously you're, you're, you're making it happen in order to help you you know, so you think if you're going through a hard time and all of a sudden glasses start smashing around you, it's going to distract you. It's going to take your mind off what you're grieving, what you're thinking about. So it's almost like a coping mechanism that your subconscious is allowed is allowed to do to, mm-hmm. to get you through. I mean, we we had um, a close family friend of ours. Her her um, her brother killed himself, and um, she never shown an interest in in the paranormal. Didn't didn't really care. All of a sudden, she wanted to come on every ghost hunt that we were doing, and um, and and I had to say to her, I was very open and honest, and I said, "Look, Matt, Matt's not going to be sixty miles away in a pub, wait, you know, kind of waiting for you. You're not going to find Matt by coming on these on these ghost hunts." But she was determined right. to come, and you know, everywhere she went, she found Matt. She heard Matt. She saw Matt. That doesn't mean that right. no, nobody else did, and I certainly didn't. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening for her in her in her own world, in her own frequency range. But wherever she went, she saw and she heard Matt. Interesting. So I wonder if that's uh, well, obviously, if that works that way, then like when you see people do occult and magical rituals and stuff like that. I'm, I'm assuming. I mean, I'm assuming media, everything works that way. I mean, they're they're obviously there's stuff in our society there's people who realize this and are using it to their advantage um yeah beyond the paranormal oh yeah i mean if you if you understand how the world works um i mean i don't know how conspiratorial we can get well Um, i don't want to do anything political on this feed right now but you can delve into a little conspiracy a little new for me if, if you realize what makes people tick and therefore you push that and they and you keep them in a lower vibrational frequency mm-hmm. then they will almost begin to create that world themselves um and, and we we see it happening regularly now with with with, with covid like if, if whether you're for covid or against covid if you're if you're not if you don't really buy into it then it's not really affected you it hasn't your 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 reality hasn't really been bothered by it if you do buy right. into it then you will see it everywhere and, and, and it will impact you. So therefore you're, you're choosing the path that you want to take and you're choosing the reality that you want to live in. You're choosing a reality of, of COVID or you're choosing a reality with no COVID. Right. Um, and, and so if, as you say, outside of the paranormal, so if you know how, how people tick and how people work subconsciously, then you will know how to alter essentially their reality. Right. So is there a chance, like? that you could go into a house where a bunch of people have lived for a long time and they've created a whole bunch of mess and you walk in and it's still there and it's like hasn't dissipated yet 
and you experience what they've left behind. Is that possible? I think that's like possible. In your theory, because I think there are some instances where I've walked in and I'm not really making it, but it's there and whoever has been there before has left it there. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there's, there's obviously famous places in the world like Auschwitz where you would go and you would pick up on this energy, you would pick up on this this feeling. And, but again, that's you, you almost know what's happened there. So you could argue that, well, you're feeling it because you know what's happened. Yeah. There's been many times where people have walked into a house not knowing what has happened there, but they felt a bad vibe, they felt a bad feeling, and then they find out that mm -hmm. someone was killed there or you know, someone was, was sexually abused there or whatever. So yeah, I, I genuinely think that the the imprint of those emotions can live on, and that, and that almost ties into the stone tape theory that we talk about. You know, where, right. where there's an imprint on 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 a fabric of a building or on on a on an area, and it it kind of replays itself over and over again. So it's almost like that, where it was so significant, the emotional damage or the outpouring of of emotions and feelings was so significant that I, I absolutely do believe that it could it could hang around. Yeah, because I've certainly been into locations where I'm like, you know what, um, I was fine before I was here, and I, I just have to go, and <laughs> and like I don't argue, I'm not melodramatic, and there's n none of that stuff happens in my house. I've also been around friends, same okay. thing, crazy yep. stuff happens when they're around. I'm like, you know, I think, I think, I think something going on with you, and they they were like totally offended. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, this stuff just doesn't happen in my house. You're here, and now weird things are happening. I'm I'm not trying to make you feel bad, so I agree with that. But I've also been in. I I also think it it can stick around, and stay there for a bit. And I don't know what you have to do. Uh, my tactic is always to clear the room out, open all yep. the windows, and clean things out, and move furniture, and order, and reorganize, and shuffle it up. That's how I kind of go at different. Yeah, and I feel like Ugh. I think everyone has coping mechanisms. I mean, um, I, I think what you're doing there again is you're subconsciously by rearranging the room by getting the air out of the room, you're almost making it a new location, a new mm -hmm. place. Um, so feng therefore, shui. A feng shui, yeah, and, and it's no longer associated with the energy that you had before. So subconsciously, you won't pick up on it anymore. Um, so so yeah, I mean, th this is really where the theory theory has come from and where it's going. Um, and again, like I say, it's not to say that it, it can't coexist with the stone tape theory, or you know, with with you know, but when, when we talk about ghosts, right? And the, the general consensus is a ghost is a dead person. And just think about that for a second. So you know, people say, "Oh, that 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 kind of barn over there in the middle of the field is haunted," and you think, well. If I was a ghost and I could choose to haunt where I wanted to haunt, I was, you know, um, it, just this consciousness, this kind of expanded consciousness that could go anywhere. Why would I choose to just linger in a barn, waiting to say boo to the one person that might come in a year? You know, that, that quite a boring existence, really. Well, so, maybe they don't get to choose. Maybe they're trapped, or maybe it's some kind of purgatory. But, and and that is a, a very reasonable. Um, theory, um, but for for me, mm -hmm. if, you're, if if I if I keep going with this the consciousness theory, mm -hmm. then you're you're kind of free to travel where you want. Um, right. So so with when, when you think that ghosts are just dead people, um, it's a very mainstream theory, and it's one that a lot of people subscribe to. And I'm sure I've told you this before, but I was kind of kicked out of a, a ghost hunt once because I asked on the um, on the Ouija board, like, you know, have, have, have you met God? <laughs> and are you a real person? And all this, and they didn't like it. And, and, and I said, why, well, why, why didn't they like it? Because, uh, because I was asking questions that they weren't comfortable with. So they just wanted to oh. know, like, are you a man or a woman? And uh, did you die here? And do you mean to hurt us? Which, of course, is the one that everybody asks because they They've watched these horror films and they I think they almost romanticize the idea of the, the ghost is there yeah. to help them. Um, yeah. and there's a demon, you know, like Zach who finds a demon around every corner. People are such a bunch of whiny babies. <laughs> You're not even asking anything like like crazy. And and so that actually brings me to another topic about the Ouija board. I I I've never subscribed to the idea that the Ouija board is doing it. I think people are doing it. 
I think people are doing what you're just saying because yeah. the board by itself does nothing. No, and the board is just, um, I, I remember doing a talk a good few years ago now, uh, and it was on one of my first talks, so it, it was all about the equipment and, and ways of investigating. And I pulled out of my bag a, a Ouija board, a spirit board, and all of a sudden people on the front row were sitting on the back row because um, they, they got very scared. <laughs> um, and I had to explain to them that it's just a wooden board with letters on. Like, this isn't the gateway to hell. This isn't a portal into another dimension. It's just letters and words on a wooden board. Um, and, you know, we've, we've done um, those kind of sessions with just uh, letters that we've cut out of pieces of paper, made a circle on the floor, and, and moved the glass between the letters. So we're not using a board. We've, we've made it ourselves. It's just a, it's a tool for communication. That's all it is. But because of the media and films and all this kind of stuff, People associate a uh, Ouija board with with the gateway to hell and demons and the devil and all of this kind of stuff. But absolutely, I agree with you. That's not the case. Um, and in fact, one of the one of the best experiences I ever had on a, a Ouija board was uh, we were at a place called Smevik Swimming Baths, and mm. uh, there was myself and a, another team member, and we were in a corridor and we were just doing a spirit board. There wasn't really anywhere to do it, so we were just on the windowsill in this long corridor. And then another guy came along, and he was he was just a guest. Didn't know him, didn't have a clue who he was. And so we started doing the spirit board together, and, and he said out of nowhere, I think this is my dad. So I instantly got suspicious and said, well, tell you what, you take your hand off the glass, me and Les will, will keep going, and then we'll ask, we'll, you ask the questions and we'll answer. So he asked about nine questions or so, and we answered every single one right. And it was things like, what was the name of the street I grew up on? um how how did how did you die what's the name of my eldest son questions that me and les would never have known right and yet we answered every single one right so there's two things wow. happening there really that either his dad was physically there pushing the glass around the board for us or somehow he's communicating you know kind of through through the through his mind and, and making us move the glass which is right. probably more interesting than a ghost actually pushing pushing the glass so if somebody believes that there's a demon in the portal to hell, I mean, that's what they're, that's, what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you believe that the glass is going to move and talk to you, then it, it will. You, you, and, and, you know, the only people that kind of don't buy into this kind of thing are, are skeptics and by their very nature, they, 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 they don't want to buy into it. So anything that you show them, they will never believe, you know, and right. which kind of leads me on to, where I've kind of taken my latest presentation, really, my latest talk, is, is the future of evidence and um, where this is going to go in the future. Because who are you trying to convince when you get evidence now? You know, you, you can show your right. evidence to uh, a, a believer, a fellow believer. Or what's the point in that? They already believe. So there's not, there's not really any point in showing them. You could show it a skeptic, but they don't believe anymore. Uh, they don't believe. They think it's a load of rubbish. And, They'll always say Photoshop, CGI, it's a load of rubbish. So there's no point in showing them because they'll never believe. So there's almost no point <laughs> in, in kind of right. showing off your evidence, you know? I, and Well, I kind of like to be like careful with evidence because there's everybody has their truth today. And I'm a little skeptical of the, their truth because then that goes into like a crazy place where they can be all these, the, whatever, five, I don't want to get political, but they can be whatever they want and you have to respect that. And it gets all crazy. I do believe there's a, a physical truth that, you know, there's laws and there's rules in this universe and you can't get around it. But I, I'm also like the, the idea that your mind can create a reality for you is proper too. But I think if your mind deviates from some absolute truths, that it's hell on earth. Then yeah. I think that's what might be happening. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I, I think if you're deviating from this universal truth, um, then a, a host of things can happen, can't it? Uh, you can kind of all of the things that have been created. Yeah, we talk about this house and 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 why I believe this activity has been created from from a mental state essentially. And if you think about the mental state of some people in the world, uh, and I don't mean that in a nasty way, there are people that that are seriously struggling with their mental health through various mm -hmm. reasons and again it's about like keeping in a low vibration if you think about that that's going on if 
three or four people in a house can 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 make a house shake and manifest pennies and have one of the children be choked in in a bed by a, an invisible entity i had a shoe thrown off off my back in a in a room where no one else was if that if that can be created by three or four people in a house i think what can happen with billions of people around the world oh my goodness yeah and and the and like i said once again they the people the powers that be know this that's why they want to control the internet they want to control what we see they want to control the news they want their narrative out there and i knew that long time ago but you know one of the things i forgot me and my husband have recently been going i knew that they controlled stuff and i stayed away from the news but you can also get into negative stuff even it doesn't matter what group it is you can get in you have to realize that there's people behind there and some of them can have be depressed have a yeah. shitty life, yeah. whether the, it doesn't matter what political spectrum they're on, they can be up to no good. And you've got to be, mm -hmm. you know, do your stuff, put your stuff out there and then take a break and step away and then go back to yourself and figure out what you want, like, and be positive about your future because the whole purpose is to demoralize us and bring us down. So we give up control. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that's absolutely right. And, and so, and that could like describe a demon. <laughs> To a that, team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you think what you could create with your own mind, you know, like a tulpa of sorts, or a, you know, this kind of entity that's existing in your house that's that's haunting you, when in fact it, it's just your own manifestation. So if if that's the case, and um, we're coming up close to the hour here, um, if that's the case where people are manifesting it, does it? kind of end your job as a paranormal investigator or is there more things you want to do or help do you still need to help people and let them know you know um, or does well, it take the mystery out of life where we have no ghosts left and no ghost <laughs> stories like what what are you trying to do i know <laughs> and, I, I almost and, and this is the thing right so i i, I don't have the answer and what i'm saying here I, i'm uh, it's a theory and i'm you know positing it really and, and it can exist alongside other theories, as I've already said. Um, I've had people vehemently argue with me when I've been giving talks, like stand up and, and shout at me because I'm because I'm giving a theory that they don't quite agree with. And you think, well, if only we could all just get on, then we would probably realise that what you believe and what you've researched is a piece of the puzzle that I'm missing, and then I have a piece of the puzzle that you're missing. And if we all just put it together think i think we would get the answer and we would probably be a lot closer to the truth i mean take the ufo field for example you have people that believe in the nuts and bolts craft you have people that believe that they're interdimensional and, and therefore that they're not real so so to speak um and they fight each other and they they can't come together and agree well actually part of what you're saying could be right and part of what they're saying could be right and together you have a whole picture so i think what i'm saying is i have a piece of the puzzle i'm not saying that i have the whole answer um i would mm -hmm. like to take the fun out of it and and i take it on a, on a case by case basis you know um i i was recently talking to a lady who, who wanted me to go to her house and take a look um just divorced going through a divorce quite messy so we've got, we've got that emotional baggage again mm -hmm. um and what what tends to happen quite a lot is about 90 percent of the maybe more 95 percent of the people i talk to they end up backing out so when i end up saying right well i can come round and i can have a look and we can go a bit deeper they 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 stop and they say no do you think they're comfortable with their chaos like they they like it it's a security really, blanket they're used to it really interesting point there because um yes and 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 th this house that we've been speaking of the family there i think part of them actually quite liked it and, and and i don't mean they liked the attention but i mean they had um there's a pro there's a program in the uk called help my house is haunted it's quite a famous tv show um they were knocking on the door can we come and investigate can we make a tv program out of it um and to be fair to kelly she was like no this is kieran this is all kieran and i don't want anything else to do with anyone else um so i don't think she, that she was in it for the fame or the money or anything like that but i almost feel like she liked the drama and that and that is interesting because that in itself is the reason I think it's created because of the drama. So it becomes this kind of like vicious cycle that they're that they're trapped in essentially. 
But, and it's almost like, okay, so th they might be used to it. Maybe it was in their childhood. Who, kn who knows where it came from? But they don't want to own it because it's kind of fucked up. Yeah. So they can just project it. It's Now it's over here. It's not me. It's this weird stuff happening in my house. But yet they don't have to own it. But yet they can keep it there because it's what they're used to. And if you took it away, they might be not even know who they are. Yeah, I essentially, yeah. Um Okay. Oh, we've had a. I have a comment. Yeah. Topos. Someone said topos might be manifested, but demons are definitely individual entities that are very separate to us. I have one that's been harassing me for years. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I hope you find a solution yeah. for that. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, again, I'd be interested in exploring more of of, of that person's background and, and you know, yeah. their, their, what what happened around the time that 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 demon entity began to show itself or, you know, uh, yeah. interact with, with that person. Well, and it's always good to, like, I mean, it, you, that that may be very true, but it'd be like, okay, like, where did it come from? Why am I feeding it? Am I doing something? Um, I mean, maybe they like, maybe, I don't know about this person, but maybe some people like that it's there. Maybe it gives them an identity, a power. I don't know. Or yeah. maybe it really is something that's bugging them and they're, they're, you know, it was like we said; it was already there in the building or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, you know? and that, that's part. That's very part. And again, it almost then becomes like this reverse version of it, doesn't it? You 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 move into a house. There's this negative energy that's been left there by the previous occupants or by things that have happened there. That makes you negative. It brings you down. Therefore, you begin to yeah. throw out negative energy, which like then a makes it downward worse. spiral. Yeah, yeah. So, and again, it's the same thing, really. It, it's what it's already what we're talking about. It's just happening the other way around in that sense. Um, yeah. You know, but I, I, I think that there are a lot of people that do that. They love the drama. They, they love the attention. They like the identity, the identity that it gives them. I, I would agree. But there are people out there that, that genuinely need help. Um, and and I, I always say, if anybody listening to this is is interested in this kind of thing and they're having experiences, please yeah. contact me, and, and I'd be happy to to talk about it. Absolutely. I and like I said, I don't think it's necessarily about attention as much as it's about um, what you're used to and a personal comfort. Yes. And maybe yeah. for some people it is about attention, but I think a lot of people, they're just, you know, you're saying I'm going to come and do that, this and this. And it's this idea of, you know, like this future of unknown if you take it away. And and so I do think a lot of things are connected. Like all, our beliefs are so intricate. People don't really understand that our belief systems have been happening maybe even since before we were born. It happens in our family and then it's our city our county, our state, our country, like there's all this stuff that's layered around us. And, you know, to take that away can be really terrifying. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you're in a community, you know, that supports you. So I can understand why some people would be afraid of that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm just a rogue. I've moved, I've moved all over the place all my life. And, but I still was anchored by certain beliefs and I lived in a haunted house and I did experience things, but I do think that there were people there, there was something there. And I think people there were feeding it with their chaos. Like you said, yeah. I actually think you're probably right on the money with that. But where, where you're going there is you're beginning to analyze people's psychological patterns and people's psychological mm -hmm. behavior and experiences. And that's actually what this documentary became about. It, mm -hmm. it became less and less about the, the ghost and more and more about the family and how they the were human. coping. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and what effect was it having on them and what's it done to them Which, as a family unit? I mean, it's just as fascinating as a ghost. Exactly. To it, be it, honest. It's, it's, the ghost almost played second fiddle. Um, and we're now in the early stages of developing our next documentary, which is going to be focused on um, groups around the UK, so ghost investigators. Mm -hmm. um, we've picked three that are based around around England, right. uh, well, Wales as well. And Perfect. again, it's going to be more about them. Why do they do it? What, what do they get out of it? What drove them to do it? You know, yes, we'll get mm -hmm. a bit of evidence and talk about some experiences, but it's more about them and what, what they experience and why they want to do what they do. So we have someone who is, she is saying, again, I think it could stem from abuse experience as a child. I have a friend suffering the same sort of thing, and her seems to stem of playing with the spirit board as a child. So that's so, interesting. So, we yeah, have they, different, different things yeah. developing. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that honesty. Yeah. That's and again, fantastic. it's that when you begin to understand the experiences that these people are having, um, it, re it allows you to really begin to see the fuller picture and, and understand maybe why they're experiencing what they are. And I'll tell you, like, if something negative happened to you or something, it's a journey. It's taking me like a decade or more to journey from crazy. Like, I, I was never really crazy, but I was surrounded by narcissists, like crazy stuff in my family. It's taken me over a decade of, you know, and, and it never, the fun part is it doesn't ever end because there's always more unwrapping of everything. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on. We're over the hour now, but you were saying people can contact you. So how can people contact you if they have some questions or a problem? I know you're UK based, so you can't physically be there for people unless they're in your area, but how can they contact you? Uh, well, I'm happy to travel around, around you know, kind of England, Scotland, Wales. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to have Skype conversations or this kind of conversation with people who are, who are overseas. Um, but if they wanted to contact me, uh, kieran.woodhouse at gmail.com. Uh, and it's spelled how it is there with, with my name. Some people, um, there's lots of ways to spell Kieran. So, so yeah, Kieran, Kieran dot Woodhouse at gmail dot com. That's it. Yeah. So That's don't forget that dot in between Kieran and Woodhouse. Yes, please, because the <laughs> one about that is an Australian yeah. plumber, and I sometimes get his. Uh, <laughs> an Australian plumber. You're either going to get Kieran with the ghost or you're going to get an Australian plumber. I don't know which one you will help you. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So, and can are people able to contact you on Facebook and other social um, media as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, Facebook, it's uh, just search for Kieran Woodhouse. You'll, you'll, you'll find me on there. Uh, I am on. Twitter X again, just search for search for me on there. I think my tag is Kieran underscore wire W I R E. Uh, you can mm -hmm. find me on there, but I don't really don't really go on there. Um, I am really just a Facebook man, and I do keep meaning to get a, a website done at some point, but I keep saying I will. But yeah, yeah. It, takes, it takes time. I have a website because I'm archiving everything, but I'm also trained in graphic design and web stuff, so. Uh, you know, it's easy for you. I've done it so much that I, I just pop them up really quickly and I change them so much. It's crazy. Well, maybe I'm like, uh, Oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't match with my room. Oh, I got, I, I'm, I'm not a good content, like a writer, like a, I can write blogs, but I'm not good at like, Hey, promotion writing. And I'm like, Oh shit, that looks shitty. <laughs> you know, I that's my problem. I might come to you for a website then. No, oh, there you go. Um, all right. So everybody, if you guys want, um, remember Kieran's books are also available on Amazon. Just type in Kieran Woodhouse. You can find, how many books do you have out? Uh, two with a third two. one. Right. And and um, the link the link to his documentary is in the the notes. I put it in the commentary. I, it will probably show up on YouTube. It won't show up on x but i will actually get a collective of your links and put them on the facebook and x um everybody um i just opened up facebook i don't have a lot i'm not really active on facebook i'm more on x so i'm not really focusing on building up x anymore although follow me on x but if you guys can go to my facebook page and give it a like and share the content and follow because a lot of the live streams happen from there and if you're like a gen x or a boomer who likes facebook um, I, I'm on there with my son and stuff. Um, it's the facebook.com slash ghostly archive. So go give it a like, go share the content from there. And I post little stuff from there all the time that I don't post on X. And um, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, hopefully you come back again. Yep, and we have more, more stuff, more ideas. That's fantastic. Anytime. All right. So all right, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I'm going to cut off here now. We will be back next week. After, are we here next week? What's the date today? I'm always lost. Yeah. So I believe it's on the 27th or 28th. I have uh, Soraya Ascath from Where Did the Road Go coming on. So it's going to be post Christmas. We have a little break here. And then I've got a good a lineup for you guys in January. Some really cool stuff happening. I, you know what? What's happening? <laughs> Let me look at this. I got my board here. So I've got um, 
Dean Bertram coming at the beginning of January. I have got Bob Antone coming to talk uh, in January. I also have a film director, Gary Parsons. His father worked for Hammer Horror and he knew all the people in, in Hammer Horror Studios. He's coming on to talk about Hammer Horror Film. We're going to do something a little more fun than ghosts. We're going to get a little more artsy. So that's all lined up, a whole bunch of paranormal capping it off with Hammer Horror in January. I still have February to book up. So if you happen to want to come on and talk about the paranormal, you can contact me at make70sgreat at gmail.com or go to the website ghostlyarchives.com and all my information to contact me there is there. I prefer people to contact by email. Anyways, thank you guys. And we will see you next week. I believe it's a Wednesday next week on the Ghostly Archives. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.